Okay. Good afternoon to all of you. My name is Martin Dubois, and I'm from Children with Prisoners Europe, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to this webinar on behalf of COPE. Um, we have more than 200 people registered. They are mostly from Europe, but we also have people from halfway around the world and from the other hemisphere. This is great. Welcome to all of you. Um, we have 90 minutes at our disposal for this webinar. We have three speakers. Each speaker will be presenting during about 15 minutes, and this will be followed by 35 to 40 minutes of questions and answers. We've also scheduled a quick online poll to which you'll be invited to participate. A few housekeeping points. Um, so please use the Q&A tool for asking questions. And there's a button uh, in principle at the bottom right of your Zoom window. And you know, you, you feel the questions in writing and we'll be putting the questions to the panel. If you want to chat or talk with somebody, please use the chat function to exchange written comments. This webinar is being recorded We'll be sharing, sharing the recording with you later, as well as a summary report, and you also will be getting a copy of the presentations. Now on the subject matter, children these days are experiencing, experiencing great uncertainty. We've seen the impact of COVID with the suspension of prison, most prison visits. Relationships are being strained, and this is particularly true during pretrial detention, when, where child-sensitive policies are often lacking. Many of these kids, to put it simply, just don't understand what is going on. Now, I will introduce our speakers. Our first speaker today is Dr. Shona Minson from the University of Oxford in the UK. Shona will talk about her research on the uncertainty children are faced with during pretrial detention of a parent and what it means for them. Our second speaker is Professor Peter Scharf Smith from the University of Oslo in Norway. Peter will explore for us the conditions during pretrial detention and how these conditions affect children. Our third speaker is Professor Anne Edelist Estrin. Anne will talk about how this uncertainty is a trigger for trauma and how and whether there are any strategies to mitigate this trauma. Anne is from Rutgers University in New Jersey, that's in the USA. So Anne, thank you for joining us at a time when most of us are probably having our first morning coffee. Now it's over to the speakers and to Shona. Shona, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I am just going to uh, sort out this screen share. Um, one moment, I apologize, just give me a second. Uh, I hope, is that looking all right? Can one of the other panelists, are you all looking good? Okay, thank yes. you for that. Um, in terms of the introduction, I'm actually not going to talk about pre-trial detention. I'm going to talk about children's experiences during, of having a parent in prison during COVID lockdown. Um, so, in the UK, we locked down on around about the uh, around about the first week of second week of March in 2020, and um, that meant that visits stopped in the prisons at that time. I think it's similar; it happened across Europe and across the rest of the world. Um, I conducted research with caregivers who were taking care of children with a parent in prison between April and June of 2020. And there is a research report, I'll add the link in the chat for that. Um, as with always with this kind of research, it was quite a small sample, um, but it covered uh, the experiences of around about 70 plus children in England, Wales and Scotland during that lockdown. Just to briefly share with you the executive summary of the report that we think there are about 300,000 children in the UK who have a parent in prison over the course of a year. Many of those children have not seen their parent for uh, some for, since March of that time, because although face-to-face -face visits were stopped and some were restarted across the summer last year, 
Not all prisons were able to do it. Not all children went to those visits. And there have been several more periods of national lockdown and local lockdown since that time. We didn't have video call facilities operational in all our prisons until January of this year. And video calls have been limited and problematic for children. Now this surmounted to an interference with children's right to family life and um, has impacted negatively on children's relationships, mental and physical health and well-being. And we're likely to see long-term effects of this. So in terms of today's topic of uncertainty, I just want to begin with a quotation from a, a participant in the study. He said, there's always a solution to a situation and I always try and find that solution, but there's nothing. It's like drowning. There's nothing to hold on to. And I think it's quite important at the beginning to contextualize the experiences of children and their caregivers. And the caregivers are really important because we know that the caregiver relationship can be a protective factor for children when a parent is put in prison. And caregivers navigate and negotiate this situation usually in extraordinary ways. Very often, they manage households so that there is money in the budget for prison visits. They reorganize people, the children's schedules so that they can go often long distances to prison visits. They make sure children are at home at the time of day when the mother or father is able to call them. But in this situation, because the prisons were locked on and we were nationally locked on, we didn't know when it was going to end. We didn't know how things were going to happen. They didn't know what they could do it felt like drowning. So this uncertainty, this increased heightened level of uncertainty brought about a sense of hopelessness to the situation that isn't always there. So what were the areas of uncertainty for children during the lockdown? Well, they didn't know how long it would last. So they were locked down in their homes, their parent was locked down in prison and nobody knew how long this would go on for. They were concerned about the well-being of their parent we had that increased level of fear at the start of the pandemic where really nobody knew what was going to happen, who was going to get sick, what it would look like if we did get sick. And we heard that prisons were hotspots for infection. So children were really worried about their parents and they didn't have the normal channels of reassurance. They didn't get to see them. They had their disrupted routines. As I said, often children have um, managed to get into some sort of routine with prison visits, with phone calls, they've adapted, they've changed how they live because of this, but that was all thrown into disarray once more because of the lockdowns. There was an unpredictability of contact. Now, in England and Wales, there was no face-to-face -face contact and they knew there would be no face-to-face -face contact. What also was effective, which perhaps was slightly unanticipated, was telephone contact. So in a lot of families, there would be regular periods of phone contact, there'd be a time of day, there would be a length of time. But because many prisoners were locked in their cells for perhaps up to 23 hours a day, they had limited availability to use phones. We don't have in-cell telephony in all prisons. And prisoners were quite often concerned about sharing phones with maybe 30 other people at the height of COVID. And so um, children were getting fewer phone calls and at different times of the day and often shorter calls as well. And so the, all of their contact was disrupted. This all added to an insecurity of relationship that where they had perhaps known where they stood with the parent in prison and with their caregiver, all of these areas of their life were disrupted. So I just want in the next slide uh, to go on to the relational impacts in a little more detail. This is taken from the research report that was infographic. I'll just read a few of the, the quotes on it. By the time we get back into prison, the seven month old is not going to have a clue who her dad is. My son has never seen his daddy as he was asleep both times he visited and that was at two weeks old. He's now three months. He no longer wants to speak to dad on the phone. He speaks about dad less. He used to look forward to visits more than anything. Now he says he has nothing to look forward to. There's more distance than before. They're not communicating on the phone with dad like before. They need to see him. So I've put four headings here and there are more, but the first really basic one is recognition that children were literally not knowing who their parent was. They weren't seeing them. And if they were very young, or had other issues with um, connecting with somebody on the telephone, they were having no contact and forgetting them. 
This was meaning that attachments were being transferred to the person caring for them rather than the parent in prison. Children were confused. And all of this was making contact with the parent in prison really difficult. So imprisoned parents were finding that the conversations they had with their children were so painful because of the children's fear, anxiety, sadness, grief, and the parent was unable to do anything to reassure the children that some parents were cutting off all contact with their children because they were having to take that pain back to their cell for 23 hours and manage it. And it just was impossible for them. This, of course, compounded the children's problems and um, was probably doing irreparable damage to the relationships. In terms of the impacts this uncertainty and, and the relational damage had to children, um, it was affecting children's behavior. It was increasing their worries and anxiety. Physical health was deteriorating. Um, I heard uh, it's on the, on the picture there, a seven-year-old who'd lo lost a stone, which I think is about six or seven kilograms since the pandemic had begun. Um, I heard of another child who had started to make herself sick after every meal. And when the mother asked, why are you doing this? She said, my daddy's in prison and nobody cares. And there were increases in anxiety, depression, self-harm, eating disorders, and huge sadness and grief. Um, children were becoming physically aggressive with the caregivers that were with them, which we know if, if a child is angry, they may not take that out on the person who they're angry with, they might take it out on the person who's closest to them and who they have the most secure relationship with, which was often the caregiver. So there was a lot of disruption within the home, children having a lot of problems with sleep and regressing. So how do we apply the things we've learned from COVID-19 across to other areas of criminal justice practice and children? Because I think what we've seen here is um, a really intense example of what uncertainty does to children's well-being. And my particular area of expertise is on is sentencing. And so I've been thinking about children sentencing and uncertainty. And if you think about um, pre-trial, Peter's going to talk about the trial and there is a sentence or there's been a, a guilty plea. Children have many questions which usually are left unanswered. Where is my parent going? How long will they be in prison? Who will I live with? Which people am I going to be in a house with? Because often siblings are separated. Where am I going to live? Will I still go to my school? What's gonna happen when they come out of prison? Because we know that family reintegration can be really difficult. If a child has settled into a new school and a new home, perhaps with a grandparent, and their parent comes out, will their mum or dad get housing? Will they have enough space in that house for them to live with them. And then this bottom one, does anyone care about me? I think certainly in the UK during the pandemic, there has been an in increasing question, I think, asked by prisoners' families, um, which often is adults on behalf of children saying, does anyone care about these children? There is a, an increasing sense of being disregarded. And I think it's sentencing that is an often unarticulated question that children have. Do they matter in this process? Is anyone paying any attention to what's going on to them, on what's going on and what's harming them? And we have a duty to mitigate harm to children. Under the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, Article 2, it says that children should not suffer discrimination or punishment as a consequence of the status or activities of their children. And in my own work, I often draw the parallel between what happens to children in the family courts when they're separated from a parent because of abuse and neglect and what happens in the criminal courts. And in the family courts, certainly in this country and many countries, there is statutory protection for children. Their interests are the, the paramount consideration of the court. The state appoints lawyers and guardians and people consider what will happen to them. And if they need to be separated from the parent, the state provides care for them. They are fostered, the, the state assesses carers, and they support them and they finance them. But children whose parents go to prison are not given any of those protections. And so we are um, breaching, and I think in many countries, Article 2 is being breached procedurally and in practice because of the way separation happens and because of the um, consequences of that separation for children. So sentencers should know about children 
whenever they are sentencing a parent and they should understand the impact of the sentence on those children, whether it will involve a change of home, carer, school or anything else. Custodial sentences should be avoided for primary carers where that is possible. Many countries that people have come from, and it's fantastic to see a, a global audience today, have signed up to the Bangkok rules, the UN rules, which say that for women, um, it should be really a last resort to separate mothers from their children. And it's also very important that uh, sentences across all jurisdictions understand that even short sentences leave a child with a very uncertain future. It's not about length of sentence, it's about the disruption and the uncertainty that a child experiences, even for a very short period of time. And there was a study that came out from the Netherlands in 2018, which had fantastic longitudinal data, that showed that adults who have experienced parental imprisonment as children are more likely to die before their peers, die before the age of 65 than their peers. And this has increased, I think, fourfold if it's the mother who goes to prison. So we're talking about um, uncertainty having really lifelong impacts on children. I will finish there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shona. Thank you very much. Peter, do you want to follow up? Absolutely. Thank you very much, Shona. Very, very interesting. So, um, and thank you very much to COPE for arranging this. Uh, I will just um, start sharing my screen because I have some slides to show as well. Here we go. In a moment, I think you should be able to see my slides. That looks fine for everyone, I hope. So, uh, yeah, my name is Peter Shaw Smith, um, and I'm going to talk about pretrial detention and the children of prisoners. More specifically, I'm going to talk about what we know from the available research about uh, the general problems and challenges associated with pretrial detention, how these can affect the children of prisoners. Then I'm going to talk in a bit more detail, uh, looking at specific practices uh, by telling you about findings from Scandinavian research that I've undertaken on pretrial detention and the children of prisoners. And very briefly, as a, a short follow-up, you can say on uh, what Shona has been talking about, I'll uh, describe how problems have been exacerbated in Denmark uh, during the pandemic problems for prisoners' children. So I have a few quotes for you to start off with, and they're from uh, this chapter, a chapter in this book, uh, the Paul Grave Handbook of Prison and the Family. Uh, it's a chapter that I've written together with Rachel Condry from Oxford, and it's called A Holistic Approach to Prisoners' Families from Arrest to Release. So what we try to do there uh, in this chapter, and what I've also tried to do in some of my other research, is look at the different phases from arrest to release and the different potential effects they can have on prisoners' children, the different, the specific problems that arise in these phases, what happens during the arrest, how does it affect the children, and during pre-trial, as I'll be talking about now, the sentence, and of course serving the sentence and getting back to the family release. So if we look at pre-trial and try to sum up the available research that we have, this research on a general note, suggests that pretrial detention can be a particularly difficult period for families facing incarceration. And stress afflicting the parent remaining at home can also affect the children. The initial process of arrest and remand can be associated with disruption of the family income, this, uh, the family income, disorientation, loss, and uncertainty. So I've tried to sum up these. Uh, common pretrial issues, which I think we tend to find across jurisdictions in, in, in five uh, specific areas. One of them has to do with uncertainty, what Shona was talking very much about, issue which has obviously gotten worse during the pandemic. So a particular issue during pretrial is the uncertainty and lack of knowledge of what will happen for how long will the detention last, what will be the outcome, outcome will there be a prison sentence, etc. Also, there is often a scarcity of information for close kin about pretrial detention. In some cases, they do not even know the reason and might have difficulty locating the imprisoned person. Sometimes close kin have not even been notified about the detention. 
you actually see that sometimes even in advanced welfare states like in Denmark. Rules and regulations concerning the trial, prison visits, etc. It can be an overwhelming experience, especially during pre-trial. Many families know little about visitation rights, attaining financial support from the social services, etc. And then obviously lack of contact. So of course, this is a general issue during uh, uh, all kinds of imprisonment, uh, lack of contact or problematic, problematic contact, but it can be especially problematic during pre-trial. Often, for example, there's a period, uh, a long uh, period, it can be a long period initially where you have to establish contact, get a, a visiting permit if you can visit, etc. And also, as I return to, in some jurisdictions, there are severe restrictions on contact during pre-trial. And so, uh, finally, some families experience significant financial problems during this phase, especially so for some families, these uh, 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 problems will co-occur, of course. And what you have then is a potential family crisis due to the immediate and far-ranging character of these problems. Of course, this is uh, very individual. It's dependent on individual circumstances, the families, and uh, we talk about the children, of course, the question of whether or not there is a meaningful relationship between the imprisoned parent and uh, the child in question, or the children in question. And also, of course, we know it's relatively little research on this, but we know that sometimes it can be beneficial, of course, for children and family. But generally, this is, a, 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 generally speaking, an extremely problematic phase and um, many families face a crisis. So one of the variations we find in pretrial regimes is um, a split uh, between criminal justice systems where pretrial detainees generally, generally have more rights and privileges compared to sentenced prisoners. That's the case in England, for example. And then we have systems where remand prisoners, pretrial detainees tend to have fewer rights than sentenced prisoners. So this is obviously quite a big difference in terms of variations in pretrial regimes. So what I'm trying to say here is not at all that in um, places like England, for example, that pre-trial is a nice experience. Um, that is obviously uh, not at all the case, nor for families, but it's still a difference that you have um, uh, uh, more rights, for example, in terms of how often can you telephone the family? Well, something you can typically, depending on the specific situation, you could typically do that in England several times a week have visits also uh, several times a week often. And in the Scandinavian systems, you have, again, generally speaking, once you're sentenced, you will have conditions which are, relatively speaking, very good in terms of uh, family visits, visiting opportunities, etc. But before you're sentenced, the opposite is the case. You actually have fewer rights. And why is this the case? So basically, on a very general note, there are two reasons for this, I would say. There's a history as, as, which is especially prominent in Scandinavian, Scandinavian countries of solitary confinement using isolation during pretrial. During the 19th century, this practice spilled over from uh, uh, facilities for sentenced prisoners to remand facilities for pretrial detainees. So what we have here, for example, are Danish remand facilities where you have panoptic, they're still in use, you have panoptic facilities with isolation, solitary confinement, etc. And uh, nowadays it's in order to protect the police investigation to avoid what is called collusion. So you have often a lot of isolation, severe restrictions on contact with families, well, all kinds of contact uh, visits, etc. I have a few pictures here also for you from um, and Norwegian police detention cells. In Norway, this system begins in the in police detention where you have solitary confinement. You can stay there sometimes for several days. It's quite a peculiar system, I would say, uh, to say the least. Um, when we talk about pre-trial, currently 
And then again, just to make that absolutely clear, once you become a sentence prisoner, you will, on a general note, you will have a remarkable change in conditions uh, 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 in the Scandinavian countries in terms of possibilities for having contact, especially if you wind up in an open facility. So currently, uh, Sweden uh, is, well, the worst example in terms of pre-trial solitary confinement, uh, ex quite extreme pre-trial conditions where prisoners are, uh, when they have restrictions, they are in solitary confinement. And these figures I have for you here are from 2013, but it's still the same. It's, it's, it hasn't gotten better yet. What we see here is that within different age groups, around two thirds of all pretrial detainees have restrictions, uh, which typically mean that they're in solitary confinement. This, this even goes for kids, actually. They're trying to change that now. Kids who wind 15 to 70 year olds who wind up in pretrial detention. So they have severe restrictions on their abilities to have contact with families. Just briefly, in, in Norway, you can actually uh, have a visit ban, a complete ban during pretrial on uh, 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 visits from uh, children even and, and, and family to protect the investigation. This is not that uncommon. So an interesting piece of Swedish research in this context I would like to mention briefly. Uh, of, it was a study on the effects of pretrial solitary confinement. And they uh, showed in this particular piece of research that parents in pretrial solitary confinement had very high levels of psychological health problems, which remain constant over time, while psychological health is gradually improved among parents with access to company with other detainees. So parents were in a specific situation. And the authors of this study attribute this difference to the lack of contact with the children and the ability, inability to be a parent, which is especially evident when subjected to pretrial solitary confinement. My point here is, of course, that this is very likely indeed also the case uh, for the children uh, who experience, uh, that they experience the same effect as a result of uh, a lack of contact with their parents who are in solitary confinement. Briefly, a couple of examples from Denmark from Danish uh, pretrial practices. So there are different variations in Norway, Sweden, and Denmark. Uh, in Denmark, the use of pretrial solitary confinement has been brought down very significantly, but still around half of all pretrial detainees are subject, subjected to special restrictions on contact and visits. And interestingly, and in a stark uh, contrast to England, for example, you don't have a right to use a phone when you're in pretrial in Denmark, only to call your lawyer. So there's an example of the result of that uh, here in a study I did on pretrial detention in Denmark. Uh, I have applied for a permit, uh, permit to call my six-year-old son, who I have not seen for two years, but they denied me permission because I was on remand. I was on pretrial. So you can actually, you can stay um, in pretrial for more than a year. This happens uh, uh, and not be allowed to use the phone even once. And uh, you cannot like in Norway take away the right to visits completely, but for around 50% of all pretrial detainees, the only visit they will have access to is a supervised visit, which we know is very stressful for the children. There will be a police officer present, you're not allowed to touch each other, etc. So the brief example I have here is a former pretrial detainee who described this regime as social violence and social isolation. You're torn away from everything. You cannot keep contact with your family. Visits are seldom and conducted under surveillance. It take years for letters to arrive and you cannot use the phone. You're completely isolated from the life you had before. And this is of course also the experience for the children, the involved children. A parent disappears and all of a sudden there's minimal and sometimes no contact at all. And um, I have two brief uh, slides left for you, just as I promised a, a, a quick example of how this has been exacerbated, all these problems during the pandemic. Um, 
again, very different uh, how the different jurisdictions have reacted. Uh, um, and also just if we look at Scandinavia and Norway, for example, they were quick to introduce iPads and thereby the possibility for video visits. They did that already during the first phase of the pandemic. Um, uh, it hasn't worked especially well always. There's been a lot of technical problems, but, but, but a lot of vi video visits have been executed. And in Denmark, they've just, when it comes to closed facilities, and pre-trial, they've just denied to do anything of the sort, which uh, uh, internationally speaking is, is, is quite uh, uh, unique as far as I can see. Like Shona mentioned, it arrived in January in, in England and uh, you can do that in Australia and many states in the US. Um, um, if you're an open prison in Denmark, you will have um, uh, plenty of opportunity for video visits, but uh, using a smartphone, but in closed facilities and pre-trial, uh, in pre-trial there's been a ban on visits for the almost the entire period of the pandemic and there has been uh, no video visits instead. And like I said, you have no right to use a phone. So what they did, and this is quite extraordinary, I think, is that they said, all right, if you're in pre-trial and 50% approximately have restrictions, what you can do if you want to have contact with, if you want to phone uh, your, uh, you can't have a visit, but if you want contact, you can phone your uh, parent, your family member in prison. If you go to one specific police station in all of Denmark, I mean, one geographically speaking, you had to move to one location in Denmark and then you are allowed to do a supervised phone call. Quite a bizarre situation. So my final slide, this is also a, a quote from the chapter uh, uh, I've written with Rachel Condry. Most empirical research on children of imprisoned parents and other family members of prisoners does not differentiate between the remand phase and imprisonment following a sentence. This is clearly the case with the available quantitative studies, which normally only record one category, namely imprisonment. This naturally makes it difficult to single out the characteristics of the pretrial phase and its potential impact. So I think that's important that we try to do that in the future, uh, differentiate and look at the various ways in which different kinds of imprisonment affect uh, uh, children of prisoners. We're trying to do that in the forthcoming Danish study where the way things look now, we can see that pretrial uh, seems to have a, 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 an additional negative impact for the involved children. So. Thank you very much. That was what I had to say. Th th thank you very much, Peter. Before I pass the floor to Anne, um, we've been hearing, you know, a lot of information is being, is being given to us here. And I just wonder whether people have any questions and please do use the, the Q&A function to ask those questions because we do want to have a, a, a lively debate afterwards. Um, Anne, up to you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Martin. I am so grateful. Let me share my screen. I'm so grateful to COPE for um, inviting me and to, for being a part of, of this, uh, this wonderful panel. And thank you to Shona and to, to Peter for the information that you shared. It's gonna sort of, um, I think, lead nicely into my focus, which is um, on why addressing uncertainty for children, both because of pretrial detention and COVID, or in the context of COVID, why it is, is so important. We're going to look at trauma um, and parental incarceration as an adverse childhood experience, and then uncertainty as a trigger for trauma, and then specific uncertainties in pretrial detention compounded by COVID with some thoughts about um, strategies for mitigating the trauma. So I, I wanna say that, you know, I started this work 42 years ago and for the longest time, the thoughts about children impacted by parental imprisonment were that yes, of course, there were lots of negative consequences and often whether it was conscious and spoken or unconscious and unspoken, 
people assumed that it was because of witnessing criminality. Um, lots of, of, you know, the research really didn't get started um, for, for several decades in, into my work. Um, and so for me, when I learned about the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, um, which began in the 90s looking at middle-aged adults and how their experiences as children um, impacted their health outcomes. And there was significant connection between adverse childhood experiences, um, this list, abuse, neglect, uh, alcohol and drug abuse, incarcerated household member, uh, mental illness, family violence, and single parenting, single parenthood. When this list came out and the connection between ad, um, adverse health outcomes for adults and four or more of these in childhood, um, it, was, it was a relatively unknown study, not attended to, except for adult medicine physicians. Until the early 2000s, when Nadine Burke Harris, pediatrician in California, began to say, why are we waiting till adulthood? We need to pay attention to this with children. And I was very, very excited about this because I thought now we're going to see that the ACEs as they're known are important because of trauma and people will see that the incarceration of a household family member is traumatic in the way that other traumas affect children. And that's really significant is why ACEs matter. And, and you know, so we could, you know, I really encourage people that, that don't have a background in trauma to, to you know, to sort of discover this um, and, 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 and use it in the work that they're doing because the excretion of cortisol into the brain and the prefrontal cortex causes behaviors in children and adults, primarily um, these five, impulse control problems, cause and effect difficulties, limited capacity to anticipate consequences, lack of social cueing and predictability, lack of emotional regulation and calming down and reciprocal engagement difficulties, the inability to share um, in conversation and interaction. There are many more behaviors and, and symptoms and effects of trauma, but these are the ones that get our children in trouble in school. These are the behaviors that lead to poor school performance, dropout rates. These are behaviors that are caused by trauma, including separation from primary caregivers. And we're also learning that many fathers, for example, may not have been the stay at home primary caregiver, but had a connection to children that was considered primary caring to the child. And so the separation and that attachment disturbance is causing a kind of trauma that we do have some research that indicates um, that you know, the, the sort of connection between attachment disruption trauma and gang involvement and also early sexuality and early pregnancies. And then of course, there's the well-known statistics on self-medicating in the wake of trauma and toxic stress, which leads to drug use, abuse, and addiction. I just wanted to introduce this because it's why ACEs matter, that, it, that those, those behaviors that we talked about or, or those circumstances cause reactions and behaviors in children. And the second part of it though, is that I was disappointed because it didn't turn out the way I expected. There wasn't an outpouring of support for children with incarcerated parents and connecting them to their parent because of course they are, um, you know, they're dealing with a family and in incarceration of a family member. Instead, the categories of the framework were abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction. And when you categorize the ACEs in this way, it led to and continues to lead to. I was on a webinar last week um, where California now has mandated screening for these ACEs in all pediatric visits, and they used this slide in the webinar. Let me say that conversations with legislators and policymakers indicate very clearly that if they think that the incarcerated parent is indeed um, dangerous to the child because they have caused that, you know, household dysfunction, and or child maltreatment, it's very difficult to then have conversations about increasing contact with the incarcerated parents. So I'm very happy to see that we've added new ACEs, um, things like you know, living in unsafe environments, academic performance, poverty, bullying, 
And that helps because that normalizes or spreads out, equalizes the concept of adverse childhood experience. I'm also really happy that the CDC has now changed the categories. Um, there is abuse and neglect. Absolutely, those are primary causes of trauma for children. But that middle category of household challenges, mother treated violently, substance abuse, mental illness, um, divorce and separation, sorry, actually changes the thought perspective and the framework. Um, for people looking at this and the discretionary decision-making about policy changes because of it. So now I wanna zero in on, on the role of uncertainty in causing trauma and certainly in exacerbating or, or re-traumatizing kids and, and, uh, and adults as well. The one de definition of trauma from Robert Scare is that any negative life event that occurs in a context of uncertainty and in a positive uh, position rather of relative helplessness. So anytime children feel helpless, parents as well, um, and there is uncertainty, it can cause trauma, it can certainly exacerbate trauma. And children of course struggle with helplessness and perceive uncertainty as danger all the time. A colleague of mine um, at Stanford talked about the fact that a young child who suddenly misses a parent, they're gone, um, has as much cortisol secretion in the prefrontal cortex as we would if someone held us at gunpoint. And so the, that sense of fright, of life-threatening to a child that a parent is gone and un, unaccessible, inaccessible, um, is incredibly traumatic. And of course, the additional trauma is witnessing the arrest of the parent. It intensifies the loss and creates additional trauma. And so often in this remand period, in this pre-trial pre detention, it's very close in time to having witnessed the arrest. And so that piece of the trauma is still um, very raw for many children and for their caregivers. And then I just wanna plug this into the context of what Harvard has been telling us for you know, a decade or more, that toxic stress creates the same um, you know, sort of stress hormone secretions as a traumatic event. Toxic stress is the unrelenting stress that can cause, be caused by poverty over a long period of time, parental depression over a long period of time, or general and persistent uncertainty, as is clearly the case during COVID and clearly the case during pretrial detention. And then it's over time. And I really want to emphasize that, you know, Peter talked about things that are over time and, and, and Shona did too. The experience that include experiences that are trauma triggers, they usually, we think of it as sight and sound and smell that trigger us. Um, but what we're finding is even a simple loss or like, I can't find my keys, or I'm not sure what time I'm going to pick you up today, son. That simple uncertainty can re-traumatize children and also that those losses that are not interpreted as loss by others, you know, he overreacted. All he did was, you know, he didn't get the seat he wanted at the table. Um, way over out of proportion. When, when we're not understanding that all loss raises old loss and trauma triggers are everywhere, our reactions to children in the wake of this re-traumatization, um, you know, are often to minimize it or actually even to, to punish kids or to reprimand them for overreacting. And now I wanna talk about the other hormone in the story, which is dopamine. So we have the cortisol and the <gasps> reaction for kids, but dopamine is excreted in situations and circumstances of calm, of, 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 of um, you know, when, when our attachment figures create a sense of safety. Adults get dopamine surges from many things. Over the course of our lives, we've learned, you know, getting our, you know, graduate school thesis done early or, you know, um, filing taxes on time or sex or chocolate. All of those things are dopamine producers. But for children, the primary caregiver attachments are the primary source of well being, a primary source of dopamine production. And so that is really significant when we talk about how to mitigate from the uncertainty of both 
pretrial detention and COVID. And the first part of that is looking at, I know Shona mentioned that the carers are primary attachment and primary protective factors. We all know most of the research focuses on that. But we haven't done a lot of research on the incarcerated parents as protective buffers. And we know that for many kids, that's the case, that, that it is true. Um, and, and so we need to think about that in terms of how to connect the children, not just because it's the right thing to do or because it's you know, child well-being and, and the UN rights of the child, all of that is true, important, and a context we need to attend to. But we also not start, we need to start thinking about the long-term implications of trauma in the absence of the protective buffer of that parent. So incarcerated parents as those protective buffers during the stage of separation, earliest stage of separation, it will often follow in the wake of witnessing the arrest. Um, it, it, the access to the parent at this time is extremely important to managing the trauma, but that access is, is probably, um, you know, if, if not at all, it's, it's, you know, there's many, many obstacles as Peter was talking about all of the conditions of remand in various forms across the globe. And we're really talking with people literally across the globe here today. The variations are huge, but for the most part, and in the United States, we have people who are in pre-trial detention for three years. Um, you know, we, we have a problem with cash bail. Everybody across the globe knows that, that we do. Um, and people are held for a very long period of time at a time in the beginning of the separation when the children most need the protective buffer to manage the trauma. And correctional policy and pretrial detention protocols will pose barriers to that access. And of course, certainly COVID does. Now the carers are protective buffers as well. And those that care for children with parents in pretrial detention um, are themselves overwhelmed with trauma and anxiety and have limited access to the supports they need. Um, they battle stigma. You know, Peter's talking about his work with, with Rachel Condry. One of her quotes from 2008, I think, is that, that the families are, are forced to hide from the shameful gaze of others and it, it keeps them from accessing support. And I really think that that's still true in 42 years of this work. It is the primary barrier to me to supporting kids is not giving enough support to the caregivers. Um, they deal with financial and life crises and they try to answer all, all in the context of dealing with the children's questions and responding to the children's needs. So here are a few quotes from some of the focus groups that we've done talking about people in pretrial detention that are a little twist on this subject to, th to think about. He won't be in there long, so we don't need to tell the kids. It's a really common phrase that we hear. So of all of the um, stories about not telling children the truth, which is very common in the United States, particularly under, for children under 12, um, and it's extra common in the pretrial pre remand period because of this idea that he's not gonna be in here for long. And so we don't need to tell them the truth. Not being told the truth raises children's anxiety exponentially. They do know for the most part, they hear it, they sense it, they worry about it. As a child and family therapist by training, I've seen so many kids who really do know. And the classic joke statement, which is you know em emblematic of the truth is the child who was three or four who said to her preschool teacher, my dad locked up, but don't tell my grandma because she doesn't know. And the idea that the young child thinks grandma doesn't know, otherwise she of course would tell her. Another one is we'll have to move in with my mother until the trial, after that, who knows? So of course the idea, this was the second most common thought that caregivers shared was where are they gonna live and how is that, particularly in the aftermath of the early stages after, right after the arrest and they know that it's temporary and they're not sure what's next. And then finally, on top of everything else, I had to tell her she can't go to gymnastics anymore. The third most common comment from the caregivers in our focus groups was about finances. And it, it was about not so much, yes, of course, they were really um, struggling, 50% almost 
of the family said that their financial picture, um, the, the amount of money earned and coming into the household decreased by 25 to 30% in the year after incarceration of a family member. But they were talking about the things the kids had to change, like not taking gymnastics class and not having money for the field trips and not having the, the kinds of things that um, financially they were able to have before. In fact, even when the financial well-being was due to illicit or illegal income. So I wanna take a moment to do a poll. I wanna ask people to think about um, assessing the needs of families during this, this pre-trial time. And I want you to think about which in your mind with the families you do work with, did work with, will work with, is the, um, what causes the most uncertainty or anxiety. You can choose other, but I also want to encourage you, if you absolutely don't know, and that's relevant to this exercise, if you absolutely don't know, to just not vote. So we're going to launch the poll here and ask people to choose which one you think most of the families would consider um, the, to raise their anxiety the most during this pretrial detention period. And it's stigma limiting access to support, decisions about what or whether or how to talk to children, financial stress, housing or changes in residence, lack of predictability in the legal system, access to the imprisoned parent or other. And then please don't vote if you absolutely don't know. Okay, I'm going to give it one more second. And maybe another second or two. People are still, the votes are still coming in. Okay. I'm going to stop and polling. So decisions about what or whether or how to tell the children was 37% of the answers. Um, and the next was lack of predictability in the legal system. Let's see where financial stress came at 15%. Um, so in our work in the focus groups, the, the uh, financial stress was always the highest along with decisions about what or whether or how to tell the children. I want you to consider if you didn't vote because, sorry, I didn't share the results. Um, if you didn't vote because you really don't know, I do want you to, I want to encourage you to consider um, assessing the families that you work with for what causes the most stress. Because I think that it's really important um, that, it's really important that we get a sense of what the caregivers and families need. We tend to assume that a lot in providing services. Um, so wrapping up, I want to think about implications for services during this time. The conspiracy of silence and not telling the truth is alive and well. Children are not told the truth, or they're told the truth and not told not to tell, or they're told the truth and they're allowed to tell, but they're discouraged from talking about it at home. I don't want to hear about it. He made his bed. He can lie in it. Kind of really significant numbers of kids talk about this. And so implications for service are supporting families in truth telling, providing resources, providing pamphlets or um, consultations around um, how to talk with kids about telling the truth in age appropriate ways. And then finally, minimizing this uncertainty and bolstering resilience, helping families with strategies around addressing this confusion and answering them honestly, as I just said, Allowing them to express themselves, which is really hard for caregivers. They need a lot of support to hear some of the real feelings that kids are having. Checking in regularly with kids, um, their feelings are going to change. We ask them if they want to talk to their parent. We ask them questions about how they're feeling, and they answer us in a way that's okay. All right, good. I don't have to talk about that again. If I'm a caregiver, 
that's not with the incarcerated parent. I don't want to deal with it. I'm angry at her or him. So if the kid says, I don't want to talk about it, good. And I don't mention it again for three months. Um, the fact is caregivers really need, and that's human nature. We need to support them around going back and asking them regularly, establishing routines and removing barriers to accessing the incarcerated parent, which the last one is really about prison um, systems and protocols. So of course we have to support the supporting connections for children with incarcerated parents. Here in the States, our National Institute of Corrections has been really focused on that, um, child-friendly visits and supporting communication and connection webinar training for correctional staff is a huge thing right now, um, as well as looking at ways to, to improve visiting procedures and protocols. But in pretrial detention, we're not, we're not really shifting it to that. Pretrial detention here is non-contact visits for the most part with, as Peter said, very limited access. Um, providing opportunities for engagement with other children, if you're a community-based organization, other children with incarcerated parents, it's really significant for kids to have that opportunity. And then of course, supporting caregivers. I think our number one sort of new thing right now here in the States is state governments creating caregiver guides. Um, we just created one for the state of Maryland, which will be published soon. It's 75 pages, it's, it's digital. So they can go to like answering children's questions. One of the sections is answering children's questions about pretrial detention. And it's all the questions about, you know, what is remand or what is bail or, you know, how do we know this or why is this happening? And advice from caregivers and from formerly incarcerated parents and from adult children who experience um, incarceration of a parent as a child. Transparency of information, encouraging corrections and other systems on their websites or in other forms of communication to be transparent, particularly during COVID. One of the issues was that families were just not getting any information whatsoever about their loved one, which is a continuation of a standard policy, which is um, we don't give information about the health of incarcerated parents to families here at all. And predictable policies for visits, um, in person and remote, whenever you can be predictable for these visit policies, it's really, really important. Um, and that's how to reach me. And we're done. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'd like to move on to the, uh, the Q&A session now. Um, we have a series of questions. Some of them are quite specific, but let me start with something quite general, which I will put to the uh, to our three panelists. And this is from Eduardo Fleischner. And he says, well, yeah, considering, you know, all the differences in, 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 in different countries, uh, how about establishing some minimum common procedures taking the interest of the children at heart? Would that be something that we could try or you could try and, you know, support and advocate. Peter, do you want to start? Because given, you know, Scandinavia is quite, quite a case apart. Well, uh, I, I think it's, 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 it's a good idea. Of course, I mean, it's always a question of how many such standards do, do we want to have? I mean, we have, uh, we have recommendations uh, uh, from the UN, the Committee on the Rights of the Child, and we have uh, uh, from the European Council, um, so should we have specific rec recommendations regarding pretrial? Um, possibly, I'm not sure. I think I think I, I, I would I would need to give this more thought. But but I think that if you uh, actually implement uh, the standards, the recommendations that we do have from the UN, the European Council, uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, prisoners, children in general, I mean it would have a huge impact on pretrial also. So, uh, but, but generally speaking, I mean, there's no doubt that we should uh, raise attention about this particular phase and this, what happens in this uh, particular situation. Yeah, so that was um, uh, sort of an answer. <laughs> Thank you. And do you have any views on this? We're coming you from know, the US I, side. <laughs> I don't because our experience here is, mm -hmm. is so different. Um, you know, we're, we're really very focused on 
the policy issues such as removing cash bail and keeping people out of pretrial detention for those long periods of time um, and trying to sort of dismantle non-contact visits, but that's not gonna happen here. So uh, yeah, it's, it's a difficult one for us. Mm -hmm. Shona, any views on this? And, and you know, we'll maybe focus a bit on Europe. I know the UK is not in the EU anymore, but still, you know, we have the Council of Europe. Yeah, I think it's really important that we don't forget about remand. I think Peter's point about how when studies are done, we just talk about imprisonment and we don't look at why the person is imprisonment. And the other end of the spectrum that I'll just sort of throw out now is recall, which is something we have here, where people are released maybe two thirds of the way through their sentence, but they remain on license for the remainder of their sentence. And if they breach any of their probation conditions or supervision conditions, they find themselves back in prison. And that um, is a real factor in children's uncertainty as well, because they've had a parent release, they're back with their parent, and then suddenly they're gone again. And they've got to wait a long time and it's a different system and it's not a sort of open legal procedural thing it's an internal reviews and and so yes i think there are other parts that we need to be applying the standards but as peter says we already have standards and um, that should be applied and if we were applying the, the best interest principle of children then that would cover all of this i see so coming back to that principle of best interest which Leads me to another question from Maya Hariri. And uh, she says that due to the extensive evidence of how traumatic parental imp imprisonment can be for children, is there an argument that um, this could amount to a breach of Article 3 of the Human Rights Act, 1988, 1998? So that's UK legislation and that says, um, that's about inhuman and degrading treatment. Um, and I think, I mean, it has crossed my mind before that definitely there are things that happen both in prison and to families outside of prison that, um, yeah, you could start to describe under those terms. I think it'd be incredibly difficult to bring any sort of action on that basis. Um, but I, I can see her point. Mm. I see Anne and Peter nodding. Well, I, I want to jump in for a second and say how important it is to distinguish. Um, <clears throat> it, you know, for, for me, that the issue is we're getting a lot of research, or a little bit anyway, on um, you know, one study that came out in Ohio talking about the that that it, there is beneficial for some children when their parents are incarcerated. Um, I really want to just you know really dig into those studies to understand the the specific details because our experience over 40 years in anecdotal um, is that it rarely is beneficial except in cases of child abuse and extreme domestic violence. Um, but the other piece of it is that there are lots of people who are saying that this trauma that I spoke of is, um, you know, that kids are re-traumatized by connecting with their parent. And that, it, it, you know, that would, fly in the face of any kind of, of um, charges, you know, and, and um, fighting against policy and practice in the UN rights of the child issues. Because if people really believe that it's re-traumatizing kids to visit their parent and connect with their parent, those discretionary decisions around policy and practice get in the way of our advocacy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Peter, anything to add? Yeah, just briefly, I, I, I think, as, as I'm sure that most people here will agree, that the key, key issue is to stick with the rights of the child. And I mean, uh, so regardless of the number of cases where it might be beneficial uh, for children, I mean, we have the majority of, of, of children where it's, where it's not the case, and they should have a right to visit their parents under decent conditions, to maintain contact, et cetera, et cetera. And as Shona has been talking about there, best interest should be taken into account also during sentencing and so on. So, so that's, uh, that's the key issue, I think, here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this, is, this leads me to a question by Nancy Lukes about, you know, what are your views on recent research coming out of Ohio, suggesting that parental incarceration can have beneficial effects 
mainly on the children's own likelihood of incarceration and improved adult neighborhood quality. I believe there was a piece in The Economist recently about this research. Well, I, I want to just say one thing about this is that <clears throat> the, the elephant in the room, I believe even for, for other countries, is the issue of disproportional representation of people of color, of ethnic minorities, of Roma and traveler populations. And when, for instance, I can only speak for here, when we're looking at communities where disproportionate numbers of people of color are arrested, are those arrests result in, in um, you know, in, in detainment and remand, and we can look at all the research all the way along that at each stage of the process, the people of color are in a diff more difficult situation and are more likely to be held over, to have longer sentences, to, to, to go back because of, as Shona mentioned, um, violations of, of probation or parole, the recidivism rates. So if you look at all of that, and then it's very difficult to, to not say that if you're a person of color, especially if you're a male, of color in the United States, you are more likely than other kids um, to, to, to be incarcerated, arrested or incarcerated. And also, you know, the neighborhoods that you live in. So I don't know enough about the demographics of the Ohio study, and I don't know enough about um, what the, the goals of the study were. So I need to read it more carefully. But I agree with Peter that if the vast majority of children are not better off um, when their parents are incarcerated on any level, on economic level, on emotional level, on traumatic level. Um, you know, so I think that, but, but I think we can't have this discussion without continuously addressing the issue of disproportional minority representation. Yeah, so thank you, Anne. So you're raising the issue of inequality. I'd like to have a reaction from, from, from Europe, from, from Peter and, and Shona. What, what is the experience in your, the countries where You've been conducting research. So um, in England and Wales, there is disproportional representation of um, black and other ethnic minority groups in the prison system um, in terms of both being charged for offenses and then in terms of sentencing. So we've, we've got that problem as well and it needs to be addressed. The numbers themselves aren't always huge. My, my research is focused on women and because the numbers generally aren't big, it's been difficult in studies with children to actually separate that out as a, a particular factor. So my research hasn't done that. So I wouldn't want to speak sort of very specifically to it, but I think we know that in terms of general trends and general patterns, yes, that's very much there. Yeah, well, just briefly, I mean, I, I think it's most likely the case in any prison system, but minorities are also overrepresented in, in, in the Scandinavian prison populations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Um, oh, we just got a question from Sarah Beresford and um, she's embarking on a project piloting the use of a child impact assessment for children with a primary carer in the criminal justice system. And she would like to have your views on how these are best implemented to ensure children get the support they need rather than something that would, you know, could further stigmatize and re-traumatize them. That's a practical question. That's for you, Shona, perhaps, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I guess so. Anne, yeah. Anne, maybe? Anne, yeah. <laughs> Mitigation. <laughs> Well, I think um, it, my, my first reaction to the, to the question is, it's so important how, to, how we design the recruitment. Um, and that's usually where, I mean, right now that's the number one issue is how do you involve the caregivers? How do you engage them? How do you get them to allow children to take part in, in you know, interventions? Um, and I, I think, Part of, I, I still always think of Rachel Condry's quote. I think that we have to begin by removing any stigma. And it's so, so much of it is um, sort of implicit bias, the background of it, the way that we frame things, the things that we say. And I, you know, I have the utmost trust in Sarah's program because I know Sarah and I know her work. I also know that around the world though, we have people 
implementing programming for children um, that is based on the assumption that, um, that the caregivers, for instance, need parenting classes. And so the caregivers don't assess themselves as needing parenting classes. So if that's part of the intervention, it raises the stigma for the incarcerated, for the parent, the caregiver. And then also the incarcerated parent isn't involved in the process in many of these interventions. So I don't know if that answers the question, but I think removing the barriers by with stigma, being very careful about your recruitment strategies, universal recruiting, like in supermarkets and, and laundromat, laundromat facilities, rather than just in the zip codes where there's lots of incarcerated people or just through child protective services, because there's lots of people that are in the shadows, they're hiding, you know, in plain sight in schools and in communities where we might not think they are. Um, so recruiting and the kinds of intervention strategies, you know, making sure that they're useful to all kinds of families. Thank you, and um, leads me to another question asked earlier by Rachel Brett um, about, you know, people hiding in the shadows, as you said, Anne, and she says that, you know, she asked, under the CRC, children are meant to be consulted about decisions affecting them including identifiable groups of children. Now, shouldn't children of detainees or prisoners be consulted as a group about the restrictions on their visits and restrictions on contact with the imprisoned parent? It's about children being heard. Yes, absolutely. And I think that's probably what a lot of the people attending here today have been, have been doing in their various jurisdictions. And that's also happened in Scandinavian jurisdictions with children's ombudsmen doing this, arguing this. Uh, um, and I think we see in some places that we've had uh, uh, some success uh, in terms of improving visiting conditions and think about, thinking more about uh, what's a decent visit for, for a child uh, coming to a, a, a prison. But still, like there's a, a, another question from Rachel just above that one. Um, concerning police investigations uh, uh, in, in, in Denmark and uh, whether or not it, it could be legal from a, the point of view of children's rights to simply deny this. It's, uh, so, I mean, still, even though we are working with these issues, I mean, uh, um, uh, there are a lot of problems. And the obvious answer is that if you look at that problem from, from the point of view of children's rights, no, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be legal to simply ban visits that shouldn't be possible at all, so uh, so we've only gotten so far, so to speak. You know, I, I also want to say that this is we have a, a phrase that we use a lot: "Nothing about us without us." So so including not only the children but also the, the caregivers and formerly incarcerated parents in discussions is really important. Including the children in decisions about visiting and about policy and practice. Um, there's a couple. There's three things that I always want to remind people. In the United States, and I don't know about other places, 50% of the kids are under eight. And so the voices of those young children, half of them, it's very difficult to gather very young children and get their opinion. So the voice comes through the caregiver. And once again, it's back to the care or support. The second thing I wanna say is that we often include these kids in asking what you know their, their preference and their opinions without providing them the support they need to, sh to share. And some of their support, some of their sharing is at the expense of the relationship with either the incarcerated parent or the carer. And, and that's really difficult when kids say later, I didn't tell the truth because my grandmother was gonna be really angry if I told the truth. And the third thing is that we have to begin at the beginning and include them in advisory boards and in, in um, you know, council meeting things when we're devising and developing programs, practices, and policies, not just later on when we want to just ask their opinion for, for specific um, interventions. Shona, do you want to react um, to this? Yeah, I, I just, I think, would flag up the work of um, Professor Laura Lundy, who has, who's a child's rights at Queen's University of Belfast, who's done an awful lot of work around Article 12 and the voice of the child and talks about how it's one thing to give children voice, but actually that includes enabling them to come to views on matters which concern them. So it's not as simple um, as saying, tell us what you think. 
it actually needs to involve more work, more preparatory work and enabling children to really be able to think through these issues as they affect them and come to a viewpoint that they want to put forward. Well, I've been listening to what you just said and what Anne was saying. So my question for me was, does that mean that we need to involve you know, psychological help for these kids so that there's a, you know, another person can speak on their behalf. Somebody who's not the caregiver or the incarcerated parent. I guess I would be loath to add more adults to the chain between a child communicating their views. Of course, there are times when children are too young to do that. I think it's more about providing them with those support structures. So if organizations are wanting to do that, and I think it's absolutely right that children should be giving their views as a group on these things that concern them. But within that process, um, we need to make sure that it is well facilitated and they are provided, maybe it's at that point, they've got psychologist support or whatever it is to enable them to then put their own views forward rather than it coming through somebody else. Yeah, we've actually developed a, a few strategic sharing profiles that get used with older youth, older kids and youth that over time to help them think about strategically, um, not only you know, what they want and, and the answer to the question of, of that is being posed to them, but also what parts of their story will they share? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question from, uh, yeah, something completely different from, from Maria Sole Lupi. And, and, and she says, um, what do the panelists think about the lack of media campaigning on children with inca incarcerated parents? And should Europe get involved? Or, you know, government in general? Why is this not more of a public issue and, and what can be done? Well, I, that's a difficult question uh, to answer. It's, um, I th my own experience working with these issues is that it's not that difficult, I mean, relatively speaking, to get media attention about these issues. And at least in my part of the world, there's been a lot of documentaries uh, uh, about uh, uh, prisoners, families, and children, and, and, and it's not that difficult to get into the media. Um, when we did work in, in Denmark uh, on, uh, when we did prison reform work, not, not research, but when we went to that stage where we began to do reforms, we tried to stay out of the media for quite a while, uh, uh, so as not to get any negative reactions from politicians. <laughs> so, I mean, there can be different... Uh, uh, um, strategies the different uh, processes but i mean on a general note of course i mean the more attention you can get to this issue i i'm sure that's uh that's that's a good idea any other thoughts Anne or shona you know i i, I think um i think that worldwide they're very degrees is on a continuum of awareness. Uh, we're at a place now in the States where there's a lot of awareness about the issues of kids and families of the imprisoned. And with all of that interest and awareness comes lots of different, you know, sort of different factions and uh, different and changes in how people perceive. But it's, it's really common now that people understand that this is an issue. How did it come about? I think it's over a long period of time with a lot of government programs and interventions and a lot of public awareness campaigning. Um, and, but still, we have the conversations and the dilemmas about whether or not uh, this is an, an issue that we need to address or do we just fix the schools, fix the child welfare system, you know, fix poverty, fix child hunger, and then you know, these kids will be taken care of. You know, in that safety net, which is an old school, 40 years ago way of thinking. And we, I, I hope we've come away from that a bit, that there are unique needs, not that those things don't have to happen, but there are unique needs of, of, of these kids and families as well. Thank you. Shona, no? Um, yeah. Yes. Okay, I was just gonna say very quickly, I think media can be like lighting a match. So you get a very quick flicker, 
but it actually doesn't necessarily have a long-term impact unless the fire is lit. And so I, I, I think it can have a place, but I also think that really strategic targeting of groups like sentencers um, and policymakers perhaps will get us further. Thank you. I have a rather, you know, you know, good, good, good question, which is really at these days of when we're all struggling with, with COVID-19 and uh, it's from Deep Patel. And this person is wondering what your views are on the use of, you know, the increasing use, I would say, of virtual visits. Um, uh, has it, you know, has it made access easier and scheduling easier? Um, but are they are there shortcomings as well in terms of establishing you know attachment with the parent? Can I jump in really quick to go first on this one? That um, I've just there's a paper coming out in International Journal of Children's Rights that I wrote with uh, Catherine Flynn, who's in Australia, and the interesting thing was that the children in the study I did had not had any virtual video calls. I don't like to call them visits because they're not visits; they're calls. But in Australia, the children had had video calls. And yet we were seeing the same kind of impact with both groups in terms of mental health and well-being that was because they were not physically able to touch and see their parents. So I think if there's nothing, they're better than nothing. But I, I don't think they work as a substitute for a visit for children. They can overcome difficulties in distance and travel and all that kind of thing, um, but certainly wouldn't want to see them being offered as an alternative to a face-to-face -face visit where that is a possibility. See Peter nodding. Yeah, I, I, I very much agree with that. It's 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 a double-edged uh, sword and it's 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 a very good uh, idea if you uh, use it as a, in addition to other uh, uh, visits and it's um, uh, and it can also viewed from that perspective, um, bring uh, shed light on some other problems, I think. For example, in Norway, they, they were quick to introduce iPads for video calls and um, um, uh, and they, they, they have made that part of the uh, system now. So they, they will continue using these iPads. So the, the uh, what's not going to happen hopefully now is that they will in any way replace ordinary visits and I don't think that will happen but it also um, it demonstrates I think they have a rule in Norway saying that as, an, as a if you're a prisoner you have a, in a closed facility you have 20 minutes uh, each week to phone someone and if you have a child uh, who you are a carer of you have 30 minutes and that's I think in my opinion just one of those old ridiculous rules which might look sensible 50 years ago, but why should it only be 20 or 30 minutes? And so by bringing in these technologies, you will help demonstrate that, I think. I mean, it's a possibility, so why should it only be 10, 20 minutes, whatever? And the other side of it is, of course, what's as, as far as I understand, when what happens when it starts replacing physical visits as, as has happened some places in the States, for example. So. Uh, you know, quickly, we only have, you know, a couple of minutes left, but maybe Anne, you want to wrap up on? Yeah, I, I just want to say three mm. things. One, one is that the technology glitches have been huge here for, for video and technology um, connections and communications. Very frustrating for kids and families. Uh, the second one is that there are advantages. Um, you know, incarcerated parents get to see the family pet or they, you know, daughters are trying on their prom dresses to show dad or introduce the new, the new friend um, doing homework together. So there are some advantages to being able to do that. And then the third thing is that in no, no one, even when it's easier for distance and time and add some little benefit for, for those things that I just mentioned, no family member has ever said they want to replace um, in-person visits with video visits. And, and so it's, it's, uh, you know, we are adamant that, that it has to be an adjunctive and an, in addition to. Thank you, thank you. We're nearing the very end. Um, hmm, lots of questions are coming in, and some of them are a bit complicated. But there was a, 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 a simple one somewhere up there, and maybe this is a good way to finish this. And yeah, for Maya Hariri, and, and uh, you know, it's basically the question is, you know, can we fix prison? I mean, she's saying, should the ultimate goal be 
the abolition of prison, or do you believe that reform <clears throat> can adequately protect the well being and the interests of the children very quickly? Peter, go ahead. <laughs> That what did you call that the easy question or no, no it's a big it's a very open question but <laughs> yeah no um, we fix it? well in my personal opinion I mean I, I don't identify as a Christian abolitionist uh, uh, but I mean <laughs> there's no doubt and this is not only a question of prisoners children but I mean in most jurisdictions you, you would be able in my opinion to uh, reduce the number of prisoners extremely significantly and you will still have a, a functioning uh, system of uh, criminal justice so uh, so that's that's uh, yeah that's my short answer yeah. that thank you shona very quickly do you have a yeah i think we need um structural change where most people are not sent to prison as punishment and um i would hope that sort of what we're talking about here isn't tinkering with the system it's more putting in place if if people are going to be sent to prison that their children that those harms are mitigated for children. Um, but I would certainly like to see us reducing the use of imprisonment massively. Thank you. And final word. Uh, I, I would say for here in the States, the, the focus on racial justice and all of it, and arrest and sentencing and incarceration um, <clears throat> and, and abolishing incarceration where necessary in that context. Um, and I also want to say in that it just addresses some, another question that we do have to support the children in the context, as Jonah just said. I want to be very clear that in all of this talk about trauma, that it's very important that we are not trying to pathologize these kids, but to provide support. And the day of pathologizing them has to come to an end. It's very difficult not to because insurance companies want a diagnosis to, be, to, to pay for services, but that's an advocacy issue that we're fighting very hard. Thank you very much. I think this is... We've, we've reached our time limit. So thank you very much, everybody. And I hope you found this webinar interesting. <laughs> I certainly did. Thank you, Martin. <laughs> Thanks, Anne. Thank you. Bye, Peter. Bye, Shona. Goodbye, everybody.